Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Recruiting and Retaining Talent, Trying to Address the Incredible Workforce Challenge. This is Susan Ryan. I'm the Senior Director for the Greenhouse Project. And before I introduce our distinguished panel of speakers, I have a few housekeeping details that I'd like to share as well as future opportunities. First of all, you are in listen-only mode but you are able to share questions or comments through the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Also, there are handouts that are available for download, um, also located on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you're having any trouble accessing the download, we can email them to you directly at, um, after this uh, session. The session is being recorded and will be sent out to you in the next few days following the session. If you happen to live in the western part of the country, I want to invite you to the Greenhouse Workshop, which will be held in Portland, Oregon on May 31st. The Greenhouse Workshop offers all those who come what I call a seeing is believing opportunity to really get in and to visit those greenhouse homes, to be able to have conversations with the staff that work there and the elders who live there. So I hope you will join us there. Uh, you can visit our website to register. Also, if you're interested in June, we have a very interesting um, opportunity to see the greenhouse homes in Detroit, Michigan, highlighting a very innovative partnership between Presbyterian Villages of Michigan and PACE. And in this partnership, um, 21 elders are able to live in a greenhouse home as well as attend the PACE program during the day. So please take advantage of these opportunities that are coming your way. So let's move on to our, our agenda today. Here's what I'd like us to accomplish. I'm going to have our panel introduce themselves and their respective communities. I'm going to just kind of reprise very quickly the workforce challenges and trends, and then have you hear from our panel relative to recruiting, the lessons they've learned, and any strategies that they have developed for success in recruiting talent. We'll talk about on, onboarding and the role that education plays in equipping uh, direct care staff for success. Then we'll go to retaining talent and talk a little bit about the coaching culture of Greenhouse and what that does to really help retain talent. And finally, we'll leave some time at the end in the event that you've got questions. Again, use that chat box and we'll be happy to address your questions. So let's get started. And I'm going to ask, uh, starting with Ricky Brady, if you would introduce yourself and then we will go um, to the left. Ricky? Hi, hi everyone. This is Ricky Brady. I'm the um, Vice President and Administrator at Clark Lindsay Village. We are located in East Central Illinois in Urbana. We're about two and a half hours south of Chicago and about three hours north of St. Louis, so right, right in between some corn and bean fields. Um, we're a life plan community and we have a variety of settings on our campus, independent living, um, 105 skilled nursing beds. 12 of those skilled beds are in our greenhouse home. We were the first skilled greenhouse licensed um, in the state of Illinois that's not on federal land. And then we also have a 12-bed assisted living with a memory care designation greenhouse home as well. We're a single site, not-for-profit, and governed by a board of directors. Great. Thank you, Ricky. Tanya? Oh, well, welcome. My name is Tanya Cox. I am the executive director of the Home Place at Midway. We're located in central Kentucky. We are midway between Lexington, Kentucky, and Louisville, Kentucky, the two biggest cities in Kentucky. We are freestanding. Uh, we have four greenhouse homes uh, with three levels of licensure. We have an assisted living uh, home. We have a specialized memory care, personal care home, and then we have two skilled nursing cottages. Uh, we do not have a uh, legacy home uh, in the area. We are part of a larger group, Christian Care Communities, which is the largest um, uh, not-for-profit provider in the state of Kentucky, um, and we are Kentucky's first and only greenhouse home. Great. Thanks, Tanya. Matt. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am the Chief Operating Officer of the St. Elizabeth Community. Uh, we have 11 operating entities located throughout the small state of Rhode Island. We have two skilled nursing facilities. One is 120 beds with a 28-bed short-term rehab unit. The other is 133 beds, also with a 28-bed short-term rehab unit. We have two HUD-202 uh, independent housing facilities. We have five adult day health centers. We have one assisted living facility that is 69 units, with 48 of the 69 units being part of the state Medicaid waiver program. And we have a home care agency that does both uh, skilled home care as well as private duty home care and concierge services. Uh, we have we serve about 2,500 seniors in Rhode Island a year. Uh, we employ about 900 people and in April of 2017 we opened the first two greenhouses in the state of Rhode Island. They were opened uh, as part of our SNF that's located in East Greenwich. Uh, we got permission from the state of Rhode Island to add 48 beds to that existing 120 bed legacy building. Um, and we opened two 12 bed homes, uh, greenhouse homes in April and the other two uh, 12 bed homes opened in July of 17. Wow, this is uh, great. And as you can tell from their introduction, these are leaders who have really pioneered the first uh, for skilled greenhouses. And each of you, as you were talking, I, I recognize that uh, you have the only licensed skilled greenhouse homes in your state. So um, you certainly have learned a lot in that process. So let's talk a little bit about the workforce challenges and trends. Um, Robin Stone, if you were a part of that webinar, you had her kind of sum it up for us, the challenge is basically recruitment, retention, and a lack of competent workers. So no surprise to anybody that the projected change in the number of Americans by age is drastically changing. Um, Robin Stone would tell you not to call it a silver tsunami, that that certainly does not have language that we would want to support, but there certainly is an age wave or a boon boom that's coming, and you can see in the slide here depicted that uh, we are seeing an incredible increase in the ages 55 to 64, and then a 54% increase in 65 plus. Um, if you read McKnight's last August, you saw what uh, the title was, A Train Wreck Waiting to Happen. And this was uh, a quote by Paul Osterman, prof uh, professor of HR and management at MIT. He quoted these stats as there will be a shortage by 2030. We are looking at 151,000 paid direct care workers and 3.8 million unpaid family caregivers. So a train wreck waiting to happen is probably aptly um, so named. Um, if you were on the webinar last month, Terry Metzger, when she was talking about uh, the finance survey and, and our summary and so forth, she was quoting some other stats from the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and really talking about the incredible demand for labor. And if you take a look at the personal care aides and nurses and home health aides, um, you can see that there certainly is an incredible demand for them. She also talked about the high industry turnover um, between all staff and direct care staff. This uh, cited from the American Healthcare Association. So Robin Stone, once again, in her presentation, she said, here are the reasons for those challenges. Really addressing kind of the leadership challenge, that it's a lack of quality supervisors, that oftentimes when direct care workers are leaving, it's because they've really, it's been lack of a, a supervisor that they really felt good about. It was often cited as inadequate training, that they weren't supported uh, to be able to do their job well because of uh, inadequate training. The lack of career mobility or the opportunity to have upward motion and to go beyond um, just, you know, I'm just a CNA kind of a thing. 
And lastly, um, inadequate compensation. Looking at that train wreck article with McKnight, uh, he summarized it and says it really, he did certainly speak to the inadequate compensation and he kind of summed it up as a lack of respect. So let's hear what our distinguished panel might have to say about what they have learned about finding talent and what they have done creatively to be able to recruit. So let's go to our rural community in Midway. Tanya? Great. Um, so Midway opened, the home place uh, opened about three years ago. And over that time, we've really adapted and changed what that looks like from a recruitment standpoint. Um, and in the beginning, we don't have a legacy home. And so we, did, we really didn't even have a pool of staff or anyone to recruit from. So we just were ground up. Um, and so we did a number of job fairs and we did events on our campus and, and brought folks in. Midway's not on the beaten path. Um, it's it's quite rural, and so it's not someplace folks had been by. And and even when they came at first, they thought they were lost because uh, they were looking for a traditional structure. Um, and uh, and so when we brought them in to do that, we really were able to take our time in the beginning and recruit and walk them through and show them everything. And um, and as we ramped up we got busy and i think we got fast with that and and so we, we probably made some hires that weren't the best because we were trying to keep up with our census ramp up which uh happened faster than recruitment of our staff and so we we kind of lost sight and we we got in that a little bit of warm body syndrome and um and we realized that we really had to back up and say what are we looking for in an individual to work in our greenhouse homes whether that's going to be a nurse whether that's going to be one of our clinical support team members or whether that's going to be a shabazz um one of the things that we found because we are rural we were com uh, competing with um, a lot of the health care that was in the area and we opted to not um, list uh, Shabazz as a term in our recruitment ads, but we listed it as CNAs and then drew them to us and then explained the difference and kind of sold the difference. I liken it a little bit to coming out and test driving a car. Once they come out and they see it, it's, it's really sells itself um, and the opportunity to do that. And so we really kind of learned in the process to slow down. We've got a team now that, um, that interviews that includes um, Shabazz and nurses and clinical support team members. And, um, and we don't use that term in our ads because we want to get folks out and we're in a highly competitive environment um, with, with not enough workers. As, as was evidenced in the slides before. And so we really looked at that and found that if we can get them on our campus and get them to us, it really sells itself. Great, thank you, Tanya. Ricky, tell us about finding talent, the right person in the Urbana, Illinois. Sure, so we did have a legacy home and we did advertise for our um, Shabazim positions internally. Um, the staff that were already here had to write an essay on why they wanted to work in the greenhouse homes and what they thought that would mean. Um, they had to go through the interview process. And um, we filled less than half, I think, from internal candidates. So then we began to recruit from outside. We advertised in our newspaper, and we did use the term Shabazz. Um, there was a link um, where they could go to read about the greenhouse project and um, the role of the Shabazz and what that meant. And in, in our interview process, um, those that had done their homework prior to coming in for the interview, that certainly um, was made a big impact to us that they had taken the time to research what that role was. Um, our homes were still being built. We were um, attempting to staff for the first home, which was our assisted living with the memory care designation. We really focused on looking for staff that were um, felt a calling, not someone that was task oriented. We talked a lot about the cooking and the cleaning, and you know what did that mean? And if they didn't have that experience, was that something 
they were interested in? Did they feel passionate about um, being with elders in relationships? Also someone that wanted to be a team member. We knew the team concept was very important and it wasn't a place for those that wanted to work solo or to be the one outstanding person in the house. So we spent a lot of time um, after those interviews just trying to match personalities that we thought would mesh together and maybe somebody that did have a cooking background um, with somebody that didn't. So really tried to staff those shifts um, with, with team members we thought would, would work well. Um, our challenge was our homes were delayed because of working through some Department of Public Health regulations. So we had our staff hired about six months before wow. our first home actually opened. So we um, we were blessed. We didn't lose any of our staff members during that six months time. We were committed to having that team. So we kept them um, working in our legacy home and getting to know some of the elders that would be transitioning to that first house. Um, but again, I, I think just really defining what type of a person that you're looking for um, and what those strong points that you want them to have. So let me just ask a real quick question. If you were to say the top three qualities that make a good Shabazz, what would they be? Um, I think the first one is the caring and compassion for elders. And I think, um, you know, we have them tell stories we gave them scenarios of how would you handle the situation, that situation. Um, and I, we learned, I you know, to listen to our gut. <laughs> I think you can tell that when you interview staff, if they truly are passionate about what they do, or if it's just a job at the new community that's down the street. Um, I also think um, someone that truly understands teamwork and what that means to work together um that we were very clear that you know they would have to cover for each other for vacation or they would have to cover if um one of their coworkers was was ill so just to set those expectations up front and to help them truly understand that yeah i like the idea of scenarios and i do like um the idea that that team concept seems to be kind of a common thread when i'm talking to other uh, greenhouse adopters oh. So Matt, let's uh, talk about some creative advertising and what uh, you did in Rhode Island to find the right person. So um, we uh, we have a legacy building and uh, we were able to add 48 beds to our legacy license to build four 12 bed greenhouses. Um, but that presented us with the task of, of hiring uh, about 65 caregivers, about 15 registered nurses, and about 50 Shabazim. Um, and that kind of task seemed daunting to us, I think, at at first. Um, similar to what Ricky said, we did uh, we did uh, start out by doing some recruiting in our in our legacy building. Um, but a very interesting uh, um, kind of phenomenon came about in that. You know, uh, CNAs that we thought would be good sh Shabazim uh, when we would ask them to consider going to the legacy, uh, to the greenhouse homes, their their question immediately was, well, will my residents be going? And if the answer was no or unknown, then there was very little interest from them in, in working in the greenhouse homes. Similar when we were asking residents uh, to go over to the greenhouse homes, their question was, well, is, is Herenia, who's my seven to three CNA, five days a week, if she's not going, I'm not going. Um, so we predominantly um, hired those 65 caregivers from outside of our, our organization. Um, because we were the first greenhouse homes in the state of Rhode Island, and because our community has a, a really dynamite uh, marketing and PR department, uh, we generated a lot of press from newspapers, from the local local TV stations, um, and you know Rhode Island's a, a small state, um, so so word kind of travels quickly. So when the time came to 
to find these caregivers. Uh, most of our advertising was in local papers. We did a lot of targeted posts on uh, on Facebook, um, and uh, we had to hire these 60 caregivers in two waves of 30 to 35 people because the homes were staggered. Two two opened in April and two opened in in uh, June. Um, so. To hire staff for each wave, we probably did about a half a dozen job fairs uh, that we advertised for. And those job fairs were very structured and purposely structured in that uh, we purposely had the people come in and fill out an application and purposely spend just a lot of downtime in our lobby area. And in the lobby, we had some trained volunteers and some trained residents. You know, we trained them what to look for. Uh, uh, how, you know, how to strike up some conversations, what to look for in the answers, and kind of just observe how the candidates uh, interacted with everybody in the lobby and also how they interacted with each other. Um, then we would move the candidates. Once we got a good-sized group, we would move them uh, into a, a conference room where our guide would give them about a 45 minute presentation on the model and what the greenhouse model is all about. Uh, we utilize some of the videos that are available on the greenhouse website to kind of uh, give them a visual of, uh, of the model. And then from there, candidates were moved into a, a two-step interview process. First step is they would meet with uh, the director of nursing and the assistant director of nursing and a few other members of our guiding leadership team. And if they made it through uh, that round, they would then interview with myself and our, our HR manager. Um, and we really focused on asking them a lot of behavioral interviewing questions, really to kind of gauge um, those things, you know, whether they had that caring and compassion that, that you need um, and um, you know the stuff that's really difficult to teach either you, either you have it or, or or you don't so we would ask questions like you know tell us about a resident you know for people that had experience tell us about a resident that you had a really close relationship with you know what was that like um, or tell me about a time when you and your coworkers really got together and either solved a resident issue or a uh, a challenge that your neighborhood or your 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 work team was was facing um so that's kind of how we went about hiring the uh, the initial wave um kind of along uh what what Tanya was saying i think um what we found is the pressure of hiring those that many caregivers especially for the second wave of the two the last two houses opening we probably felt that pressure a little bit and probably did hire some people that today we probably wouldn't hire. Um, the CNA marketplace in Rhode Island is very competitive. I mean, it's a small state, you know, it's 50 miles long by 20 miles wide. And within that geography, you have 84 nursing homes, lots of assisted living, lots of home care agencies. So it's a, it's a very competitive marketplace. Um, we've since, now that we've kind of, Things have settled down, and we've had some turnover. What you're seeing now is an is an ad we've been using um, that gets posted on our our job board, um, and it's a quote from one of our um, Shabazim um, and a little description of of what it means to be uh, a Shabazz. Well, I'm going to read that testimonial because I think it is so beautiful and really just. To be able to take it from the words of somebody who made that transition and is loving it. Greenhouse life is like unlike anything I've ever seen or experienced. Not a day here has felt like work, but rather a chance to spend quality time with my second family, both the elders and my coworkers. The job pushes you to do things you've never done before and work on skills you never knew you needed or had. I'm grateful every single day to be part of something that is truly changing lives for both the people who live here and the people who work here. And I think that sentiment just really captures what I've heard each of you say and really describing what does it take? Um, who are we looking for? What is talent? What's the profile of um, a good Shabazz or a good direct care worker? 
So let's talk about onboarding and the role that education plays. Education is such a bedrock to the greenhouse model. And, you know, to Robin Stone's point, inadequate training seemed to come up a lot when uh, she was doing the exit interviews of those leaving the workforce. So, Matt, can you say a little bit about uh, the role that education played for equipping your CNAs to become Shabbatim? Josh, sure. So, um, so we uh, we brought all the new hires that were going to be working in the first two houses. So the houses opened in the end of April. So uh, in the uh, in mid March was basically all of their uh, the first day of employment. So uh, for that month, uh, that's they spent um, eight hours a day, five days a week, uh, going through all the uh, initial uh, greenhouse training. Um, and you know, I have to say, um, the ability to do that and do that mass training not only is the training excellent, but it's it's just the bonds and the relationships that form between those caregivers. It started happening within within days, and I'll I'll never forget uh, one moment that really stands out for me is I walked into one of the houses and it was it was their last day of the core training and it's the part of the training where they all kind of stand around in a circle and they you know verbally tell the rest of their group what it is they're going to personally commit to. Um, and the things I heard said in that 40 to 45 minute uh, learning circle are, are things I've never heard caregivers say to each other um, in in my 24 years of of, uh, of working in the industry. Um, so um, the training was very impactful, and I think it really set us up for success, uh, mainly by the tools it gives you, but also just by the way it just it starts to form those bonds and relationships of the of the team members that'll be working together. Wow, that's that's beautiful. That's uh, well said. And I think the other thing relative to education at St. Elizabeth's, I do remember having a conversation with you and uh, Steve Horowitz, the CEO there, about culinary training and how well the Shabazim seem to have been equipped through the education to be able to. Uh, learn how to prepare uh, meals and to do it so well. Um, let's move on, though. We'll go to Tanya. Uh, Tanya, you've done some really creative things to really make kind of that ongoing education and support work. Can you speak a little bit to what you have done to really get creative here? Sure. Um, you know, we were kind of similar to uh, Ricky and, and, and Matt sharing in the beginning, you get this great group of initial people and you can take your time and you put them through training and there's all these wonderful relationships that get built and, and that worked beautifully. And then we, we opened our houses and we started to fill up and, and we would hire one person here and one person there. And it was hard to pull together a core class. And so we did Encore to get the values, but what was missing was that huge relationship building because, you know, as Matt said, that commitment to one another is probably one of the most powerful things that I think they do in core. And um, and so we kind of lost our way a little bit there. And then we try to re-get back to it and say, okay, we've, we've hired, you know, 12 new people over the last six or seven months. Um, we need to get them into core. And then we'd put it on there and then time would go by and we'd say, we need to get in core. And so one of the things we did was I said, we have got to make reinstate our commitment to this initial education because that's what really helped to set the stage for success in the beginning. And so we went and on every single month we put core on the calendar. And so it is blocked out and it's ready to go. We don't always do it because we don't always have a core class. But there's not a chance where we're just having to figure out where we're going to put it in. Um, and therefore, folks aren't having to wait too long before they get that chance to come together and be with others and do that relationship building. The other piece that we did was knowing that they may be working for a month or two months 
before they really get that core and, and start building that relationship was we started a mentorship program. Um, our mentors had to apply to become a mentor um, and they interviewed and they received training. Um, and so each one of our new hires is assigned to a mentor. Um, we have uh, Shabazim that are mentors and we have nurses that are mentors. Um, and they have a checklist and, and it goes over things like learning how to do convivium, talking about that. Um, but it also gets to the retention piece because built into that, it's not just showing the ropes, but it's actually having a go-to person once you're getting a little bit um, on your own to go back to and say, help me, I'm struggling with this, I need support. Our mentors are incentivized by length of stay for the new employee. And so um, they receive a bonus payment for being a mentor um, upon 30 days, and then they get a bonus payment at 90 days, and then they get a bonus payment at six months if their mentee is still with us and being successful. And so they really become very invested in that retention piece, and it helps bridge waiting for core. And so it really just was a really nice addition to kind of get folks bought in and, and into the values and into the, the rhythm of, of the, the culture of, of the campus. So. Wow, that's great. And I appreciate that intentionality around education and just um, kind of highlighting what Matt said about those relationships and bonds that form. It sounds like the relationship between the mentor and mentee is pretty significant. Um, and, you know, addressing kind of the compensation piece of everything, it sounds like, Tanya, you have learned that incentives matter. And, um, you know, let's definitely help to address kind of that wage, um, the inadequate wage situation. So let's move on to retaining talent. And Ricky, I was, uh, when we were talking earlier, so impressed with uh, what you've learned with your turnover rates and um, really kind of the, the role that education, you know, we've talked a lot about the role that education is playing with regards to equipping the self-managed work team of Shabazim, but equally important and impactful to turnover rates is the impact uh, of education on leaders and establishing a coaching culture, which is, again, part of the DNA for uh, the greenhouse model. So talk to us about that. Sure. So our turnover rates in our greenhouse home um, for our Shabazim is 7%. Um, one of the commitments that we made as one of our key strategies this year is to further develop that coaching environment across all of our campus. So we put our entire leadership team through coaching for partnership, and that included our CEO, our vice presidents, our department heads, and all of our frontline supervisors. Um, that culture we think is key to employee engagement, um, to employee satisfaction, and, and so the frontline employees truly are the voice of our organization. We often partner um, with someone else to practice, you know, what does that coaching conversation look like? You know, it's very easy for us to slip back into those old habits of answering questions or giving directives or giving um, directions, but to truly empower the frontline staff, whether they're in the dining department or the housekeeping department or within the greenhouse homes. So we um, have work groups that are working in our legacy building. Um, we're aligning ourselves with the greenhouse principles and legacy as well. Um, so I think, Coaching is, to me, is was one of the most challenging things I think for all of us, especially those in leadership positions, because we are so used to making decisions and, you know, being the one that the staff comes to and asks the questions of. So, just it takes practice. It takes a conscious effort. I think um, none of us, I think, don't think would use the word easy when it comes to to being that coaching leader. But I really do think it's because we have a commitment from the CEO, um, you know, this is an important thing for all of our leaders to develop and to grow in. Um, again, ongoing education, cannot say enough about the greenhouse education that's provided and, and to trust that process and to trust um, what's outlined in that curriculum. 
And Ricky, just if you could contrast for us the difference between turnover rates in the greenhouse to your legacy home. 7% you said in greenhouse. Uh, and um, last year, CNA turnover in our legacy home was 54%. Wow. So obviously, <laughs> and, uh, in, and to your point about coaching, coaching's not easy, but it takes intention. And I love what you said about an intention to keep practicing, that it's so easy to slip back, but that uh, there's a real intention from, it sounds like the CEO all the way down to make sure we continue to have uh, coaching conversations and practice. Absolutely. And I think you have to be comfortable, you know, um, calling out your peers, if you will. If you see them in a conversation or a situation where that coaching opportunity didn't happen, to use that as an educational moment right then, you know, and how, how might they have handled that a little better, perhaps. So, again, it's, it's practice and feedback and um, being open with each other. Wow, love that. So, Matt, why don't you talk a little bit about what you have found? Um, I know it, it kind of translates into family satisfaction, but really want you to kind of build on Ricky's point about the role of leadership and specifically think about the role of the guide as that supervisor for the self-managed work team and its impact on the team and on families. Sure. So, you know, I think we've all heard the, the saying, uh, happy staff equals happy residents and happy family members. Um, and I think a key to having happy staff is definitely uh, who you put in the position of guide for the greenhouse homes. I think it is such a critical position and such an, uh, such an important role. Um, and I think, you know, St. Elizabeth home was very fortunate um, to, uh, to, ha to, to have our first guide and she's a fantastic guide. And, um, so uh, her name is Sarah. Sarah has worked for St. Elizabeth home for over 15 years. Um, she came to us as, uh, as a young uh, woman, uh, was a uh, assistant in our activity department on our memory care unit, became the activity director of that unit, then became the assistant activity director and the volunteer coordinator for the home. And um, Sarah was always somebody right from the get-go uh, that didn't didn't was a kind of a fresh set of eyes to the to the nursing home industry. And it was just striking to me how uh, she always kind of questioned surplus safety over quality of the residents' lives, and uh, she would bring those issues to the table um, constantly. And I think it was probably in the later part of 2007, 2008, where we had been trying to bring the greenhouses to Rhode Island. Um, Sarah and I were at a Eden uh, certification training. Um, and I said to her, I said, you know, Sarah, I said, if we ever get the opportunity to, to build these greenhouse homes, you would, you'll be, you would be my choice to be the guide. And uh, she has kind of run with that ever since uh, we had the opportunity to really provide her with a lot of the upfront training to to uh, to prepare her for the role. Um, but, you know, like um, I believe it was Ricky said, you know, um, Sarah is somebody who embraces the coaching philosophy. Um, she's constantly um, telling um, the the nurses and, and some of the other department managers that spend some time in the greenhouses. You know, it's not your problem to solve. You gotta, you gotta bring that back um, to the Shabazim and let them come up with the solution. Um, but I think what makes Sarah really special is, you know, everyone that's ever met her has a daughter. Um, but I hear her say all the time when she ends her team meetings or when she just ends casual conversations with the Shabazim, I hear her say, "Remember, let's take care of the elders and let's take care of each other," um, and mm. that that whole mindset of the Shabazim also taking care of each other um, is just profound in, in, in that model and it has a lot to do with our, with our guide. Wow, that's a beautiful mantra and um, just so embodies so much of what you all have been saying. 
Tanya, why don't you build on that and let, let's talk about how important the guide role is and kind of what you have learned about kind of developing your own checklist, if you will, for finding that right person. Yeah, I, 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 I love that the stories that that, that just shared. And I, I like what she says. I may, I may take that uh, and use it because it's a nice way to say that to take some care of one another because I think as I look at the checklist, one of the things I put, and I'll jump down a little bit, is, um, is really somebody who maybe has been a successful leader doesn't always make a great guide. And being a servant leader, being um, being there to take care of the the Shabazine so that they can take care of the elders and, and do what needs to be supported, I think is very, very uh, important for, for a guide. Um, and, and with that, one of the things we found is that just even sometimes some of our support team members who are really great and, and really uh, embrace the values of Greenhouse Home are still really comfortable with a chain of command. And and so when you come in as a guide, you you, you find it hard to coach because you, you're used to that more hierarchical uh, structure. And so looking at folks that really can sit back be flexible and realize there's more than one way to solve a problem. It doesn't have to be my way. Um, and really just being comfortable to let that go and see where it takes you and letting people make a few mistakes because that's, that takes being comfortable in that and being flexible and thinking um, outside the box. So when we look for guides, we look at folks who can, who can do that and, um, and really you know, sit on their hands. I, th I think Ricky said, you know, it's hard for sometimes for leadership. Um, I tend to be a fixer. And so it's hard for me sometimes because I just want to fix it. And I see that as helping, <laughs> but it's not when you're in, in the house. And so they get stronger and learning that the teams get stronger, the more they solve and the more they do and decide on their own and they build those skills and they build stronger relationships and more trust. And so you have to you have to be comfortable sitting back and watching that process happen and having the patience um, to do that. The other thing I put in there was curious, and and I was trying to find the right word for it, but it's somebody who can ask really good questions to help move the Shabazine and the teams forward, and wants to understand why, so that they can coach along that instead of kind of saying, well, I've seen this before and this is what you should do and this is how we should do it. But really asking and getting underneath um, and, and asking the right kinds of questions, curious questions that really get the team to think and then lead them towards their own decision making. And so really being that support uh, piece. But it, it takes that unique individual to find that. So. Tanya, that was fabulous. And I Hope all of you on the call are taking good notes because the, what you're hearing is not only just good thoughts and advice from the people that are speaking, but it really is, is borne out in research that has been done on Greenhouse. And it really, it, this is all such a function of leadership and you all have each really highlighted so nicely some very salient points that have been borne out in research. and. If you have interest in research, happy to share a little bit about what we've um, discovered. But Ricky, I'd love for you to talk about, we've got a self-managed work team. It's a versatile worker, universal worker. They're doing many things. So really making sure that there's consistent staffing, there's role ownership and so forth. There's a lot on their plate. How do you make it happen? And what have you done at Clark Lindsay to ensure success? Uh, Ricky, are you there? Thank you. <laughs> I'm <laughs> muted there. So what we did from the beginning was we were committed to those coordinator roles. So um, as we built our team and they, they chose who was going to be in those roles, um, there was accountability. Um, we used the guidelines that, that came um, from the greenhouse as to what those duties were. But I think one of our um, our biggest successes um, has been in self-scheduling and we started out aside from the first two weeks that the house was open our staff have done their own schedules both nurses and Shabazim since we opened the home and they are literally given a blank calendar for the month they do the schedule a month at a time 
and they work it out between the Shabbazim on their shift. Um, who's going to cover um, the days and, and the shifts? And then our scheduling coordinator, um, you know, she's got everybody on, on text message. They set up a Facebook page that they can talk about open shifts. So they really have taken ownership and know how important it is for staff that know the elders to be the ones that are in that house um, covering for each other. We had a, a situation, I, um, I have two sisters, one works in our skilled house and one works in our assisted living house. And one of their um, sisters was gravely ill and um, in the hospital, and we knew that both of them were going to have to leave literally um, one day to, to go to the hospital and be off for an extended amount of time. And I, I don't think those two Shabazim were out of the house probably for an hour, and the Shabazim in both homes had already talked message and had their shifts covered literally for as long as they needed so they could be with their sister who was dying. And, mm -hmm. you know, that didn't take a phone call or a request um, from myself or from our guide. Um, since the day that we have opened, we've not had to work um, ourselves in the greenhouse home as a staff. The um, nurses and the Shabazim have taken that role very seriously. I think one of the challenges that we faced in particular with the food coordinator role was we were committed and that the Shabazim would be the ones to, you know, in conjunction with the elders would determine the menus. They would make out the grocery list. We use an online grocery ordering system um, and that our groceries are delivered. But it's been very challenging for that food coordinator to find time during their regular scheduled shift that they work to do those duties. I mean, it takes a while to sit down and prepare that grocery list and put the order in. So um, we do allow them time outside of their normally scheduled work day to perform those coordinator roles if they need to come in, if the housekeeping coordinator needs to talk to um, the housekeeping supervisor in Legacy Home about a cleaning technique or the food coordinator needs an extra, it comes out to be about an extra hour and a half um, to two hours every week to put that menu together, to put that grocery list together and um, keep track of what's in the house, then we're committed to allowing them time to be successful in their role and time to do that. And I, I think you have to, to truly find out what what is it they need, what do we need to support them so that they can fulfill those coordinator roles the way that they were intended. That's uh, beautifully said. I'm going to just speak very quickly about empowerment and to just, you know, empowerment is one of those things I believe it is a function of leadership. Here's what we know from research that Shabazim interpreting empowerment, there's a group that would view it as I get to decide, I'm in charge now. And the other interpretation is empowerment seen as I'm a responsible team member. I'm a part of a team. I'm a vital member of a team. And I think these leaders on the phone are certainly, you know, those leaders that are really helping Shabazim to be successful by helping them understand they're a vital part of a team. It's not that the pendulum has swung and they are suddenly in charge and in power single-handedly but they are part, a vital part of a team. And I think that's hugely important. I'm not going to take time to show a real quick video, but I will have Rachel include a link to a video about what leaders in greenhouse homes have said about empowerment. Um, and I'm going to go actually to Midway. And Tanya, if you could just share your story about uh, self-scheduling at Midway. Not only does Ricky have some great stories on self-scheduling, but uh, Tanya, tell us about Midway. Sure. Um, you know, we started out in the beginning when we were fully staffed with self-scheduling um, from the start, and it it worked well. It was bumpy. Uh, staff learning how to do that when it's a skill um, that they're learning, how to be self-managed and that kind of thing. Um, but our very first holiday season, uh, it's sort of similar to to Ricky's um, uh, scenario because I, I looked at our support team and I said, have we talked about the holidays? And when we got to them, they were already done. 
they had created um, uh, a system so that they could determine who wanted to be off for Christmas Eve and who wanted to be um, off for Christmas Day. And then they they said, okay, so um, if I can work a couple hours here. And we allowed them really to have that freedom to say, look, let's get it covered and this is what we need. But how you do it is completely up to you all. And they did it beautifully without any intervention on behalf of of our support team and um and that to me showed just how powerful it could be because they negotiated and they compromised and they really they developed a system frankly better than we had in mind when we were going to talk with them about it and so uh it was a good eye opener to say this this can be done our challenges have come as we've ramped up um, our census filled up much faster than the hiring of staff and so it was a little hard I felt like we gave them a puzzle sometimes with not all the pieces. And so we found uh, we go back and forth with more support for the self-scheduling. Um, and then we pull it back once we get uh, fully staffed and they've got their pieces. And then they have to kind of relearn that a little bit. But it's, I, I feel like it's part of the journey of, of being a new campus and, and, and getting settled. We've allowed them with self-scheduling. They have a total number of staff hours a day. But one of the things that came up for us recently was that um, our elder population in one of our houses was really changing and their needs were changing. And they were realizing that that sort of traditional structure that that they had set up at seven to three, three to 11 really wasn't working for them. And so they asked if they could change it up. And, and we said, sure, these are your hours that we've got to work with. And they changed when they came in to really adapt to the heaviest work times and that was completely up to them and when they felt like they were the most effective and it wasn't those kind of shifts that we had set up that were traditional and um and so they 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 have a nine to nine shift and and they've got it without going over their hours and they they really were able to figure that out to better meet their elders needs and i think they're more successful so it kind of goes to everything we've been talking about with when we sort of get out of the way and empower them to do it they really can and we give them the tools like here's your total number of hours and this is what we have to accomplish and that they can really do it and it's exciting to see it when it happens well i think you're speaking to the role of, the, of a leader as well to really be in partnership to make sure they've got the tools as you called it or or the support um or the pieces of the puzzle i liked your frame there and matt I love the story of M&Ms. I love M&Ms. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you have found about the elder and team empowerment. So it was shortly after uh, two of the houses opened. We were probably maybe two weeks into uh, uh, the houses uh, up and operating. And um, I had heard about a story of one of the Shabazim in one of our houses, um, one of the residents mentioned to her that he was particularly at that time craving M&Ms. And what she did is she checked with her two other Shabazim in the house um, and they figured it out. She uh, dressed, you know, put his coat on and took him in our uh, company owned uh, caravan, drove him to CVS and bought some M&Ms. Um, she did that without having to ask one person uh, with any authority over her. It was just checking with her coworkers, covering for each other, and and uh, and making that happen. She knew where the keys were for the vehicle, and she uh, and she took it. Um, and you know, I think that sounds very simple, but I think most of us know and in long-term care that for that to happen that easily and that naturally is 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 a bit unusual so uh it, it was quickly after we opened that uh, i began to realize that we had something uh, we had something different wow that's that's great and you're absolutely right that doesn't happen so quickly <laughs> in the traditional long-term care so we're going to end this part of the call and i'd just like each of you just to share you know, what I really love about the model, it really is about empowerment. It is about growth. And it is about that CNA who's now a Shabazz really acquiring more life skills. So Tanya, talk to me a little bit about where you have seen the acquisition of life skills happen in the greenhouse model, uh, especially at Midway. 
Um, sure. I, I love watching um, some of uh, the Shabazz grow and, and show that. I, I had a recently, I shared this story with you earlier, that we had a, we have a Shabazz and she is, she's young. Um, you know, uh, she's 19 and young and a single mom. And when she came to us, she had kind of a low self-esteem, warm, loving, um, didn't know how to cook didn't know how to do anything, scared to death to be in the kitchen, um, avoided it, uh, all of those things. And she's been with us for about a year now. And I've just seen her grow in her confidence. And I've seen her grow in her abilities. And the other night, um, I was coming through and visiting and uh, they were having soup for dinner. And um, she pulled out the frying pan, a skillet, and um, I said, what's she doing? I thought we were having soup. She said, we are, but I'm making a roux so that I can thicken it a little bit because the elders like it thicker. And I said, listen to, to, to you. She was scared of the kitchen, and now she's using words like roux. And the, the soup was actually better once she thickened it up. And, um, and she seemed very proud of herself, and she's contributing, and, and, and it's helped her feel better as a mother. Um, and just as an individual that she's gotten those life skills, and it, it was really exciting to see. Wow, that is fabulous. Ricky. Um, Ricky, are you on? Thank you. I was muted again. Um, I think one of the things that, that I've seen in particular when our staff rotate um, through those coordinator roles, the food coordinator um, and the budgeting that comes along with the responsibility. So it's very different when you have to plan a menu and budget for um, the cost per day for the food for our elders than it is for um, your own household. And so giving them a target number to stay within and how they have learned to budget the food money. And we have one particular group of Shabazim that like to throw a pizza party every now and then. And um, how they, they, they shop the sales, they plan the menu, um, and maybe, you know, we don't have steak that week because we know we're going to order pizza on Friday night. But just some of the budgetary life skills that they've acquired um, not only from, from the food, but by being a part of, of the house and the, the daily running of the home and, and knowing that we have a budget to stick with. And that, I think, has been very valuable um, to our Shabbos Eve. That's awesome. And finally, Matt. Well, I think if you, if you go back to um, the quote that we use for our, for our ad for Shabbos Eve, uh, Chrissy says in that quote, the job pushes you to do things you've never done before and work on skills you never knew you needed or you knew you had. Um, and Chrissy will tell you that prior to this, she she couldn't she couldn't pick out the pick out a cucumber from from a zucchini in the grocery store. Um, and now and now she's she's a she's a very good uh, she's a very good cook. Um, but I think you know life skills around conflict resolution, communication. Um, are things that are just applicable uh, outside of work and, and, and applicable in, uh, in everyone's personal life. And, you know, I was telling Susan this recently when I saw her in Washington, D.C. for the Leading Age Peak Conference. Is we had almost been open for a year. And what, what, amazes, what amazed me is that in, in, in almost a year, um, I had yet to receive a phone call from an upset family member or an upset resident um, from uh, from anybody from the from from our greenhouse uh, from our greenhouse homes, and I think that speaks a lot to the skills our staff learn in in in, in addressing complaints and handling complaints and communicating with family members and that. But I think it also speaks to just the relationships that are built between the family members and the caregivers. And when family members do bring concerns to them, they feel confident that they're going to be, that they're going to be addressed and they're going to be handled because we're, we're not perfect by any means. We, we still continue to make mistakes, but it just, it's just obvious that family members never feel the need to take it, to 
take those complaints to a, to a level higher than the direct care goes. Wow, that's great. You know, I realize we're at the top of the hour, and I want to be respectful of our panelists' time, but I do know that there are questions in the question box. Here's what I'm going to do uh, to honor the panelists' time. Um, if you've got questions, I'd like you to put them there. We will get your questions answered to you. And in fact, it's uh, made me realize that we probably will need to have a panel back to uh, address some of the questions and we'll kind of go a little more deeply. But uh, I can't thank enough uh, Ricky, Tanya, and Matt for sharing your strategies for success and your lessons learned. I can't thank you enough for the leadership role that you play in your organizations and the impact that you are having on really changing the field of long-term care and really creating meaningful jobs uh, for people and growing people. So thank you so much. Uh, I live vicariously through the likes of you every single day and I'm, I'm very appreciative of your work. So again, if you've got questions, please feel free to um, send them to us. Uh, Rachel will get out a copy of uh, today's presentation, as well as a link to the video I referenced on empowerment. And uh, thank you again for joining today's call, and uh, we will talk to you again soon. Thanks so much.